Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to have come to this study case about Lyon Confluence Project. The future of the climate lies largely in the hands of the territories, in particular the urban territories, which represent 75% of greenhouse gas emission and also all the levers for action. In, ter in terms of combating global warming, the city of Lyon has been a front runner for many years now. The basis of our mobilization is an exemplary territorial climate energy plan produced in 2007. The result of, of a large mobilization of local partners. We got already remarkable results. A 12% reduction in grass, greenhouse gas emission between 2001 and 2014. Of this total, the climate plan is responsible for at least minus 170,000 tons of CO2 per year. The three main axes of action are the mobility policy, the energy policy, the housing policy. Policies are embodied in practice in exemplary districts. Lyon Confluence is one, is thus one of the largest city center urban expansion projects in Europe. It is the only district in France to have been awarded the Sustainable District Label by the World Wide Foundation, just, uh, just like Mazda City. The area comprises 150 hectares between the Rhône and Saône rivers, extending out from the hearts of Lyon's city center. The land was reclaimed from the water between 1770 and 1850. And for a long time, the, the area was used for industrial and logistical activities. The disappearance of these activities grad gradually created in industrial brownfields and a land reserve at the heart of the urban area, but with many assets. A central location extending out of, of Lyon's peninsula, very efficient public transit service, train, metro, two tramways, 7,000 residents in a quarter that has been inhabited since the 19th century, and at last, a landscape of exceptional quality at the confluence of the two rivers, featuring five kilometers of riverbanks. This project is really a product of a strong political commitment of Lyon's mayors from Raymond Barr to Gérard Collomb today. They all have the ambition to regenerate the whole area, thus doubling the city center, yet in keeping with the climate plan. The project began in 1998, but it soon appeared that numerous challenges were to be faced to carry it out. The first of, the, of them was the financing of the decontamination process in order to make the area compatible with its new users. At present, all the, works is all the work is completed or in progress. For the first phase, no less, not less than 250,000 tons of soil were removed and decontaminated in the treatment center. So today the key figures are reclaimed industrial land, 70 hectares, 25,000 jobs brought to the district, 16,000 residents by the end of this project, 35 hectares of public spaces, 
25 to 30 hectares of green space in the overall project. The decision to transform the industrial brownfields was based not only on the desire to recover a prime location, but also to make this area into a showcase of an ambitious city of the future. A smart, smart sustainable city, a walkable city conducive to new forms of mobility, bold architectural statements, a city for everyone fostering social diversity. This project has been planned in two, two steps. We are in the second step nowadays. This second step will be finished in 2025 and at this time will we'll have made will have built one million square meters. And now as a conclusion to my address, I would like to show you a five minutes video which will give you a glimpse of the development of the Lyon Confluence project. In the heart of Lyon, the most important urban transformation in Europe, in size and innovation, is underway. The ancient centre of Lyon is built on a peninsula between two rivers. The northern half is a part of Lyon designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. The southern half was, as recently as ten years ago, an industrial wasteland. 370 acres are being transformed in two stages. The first, begun in 2003, is now finished. The second is just beginning. Among the achievements of the first phase is the tramway extension. By passing under the arches of the Parash train station, connections between the confluence and the rest of Lyon are now much easier. In front of the train station, at the entrance to the confluence, there is now a large public square, la Place des Archives. Soon, the arches under the station will become a passageway and open to light. On the side of the Rhône, the Place des Archives is bordered by an ancient prison, which will be transformed for other uses. Saint Blondine, a neighborhood created in the 19th century, will be the object of an eco-renovation. The goal is to reduce energy consumption in existing buildings by 75%. Most of the first phase focused on the side where the Saône River runs. This included a long walkway along the riverbank, a new life for the Port Rambo docks where job-creating businesses have located, an inner harbour with terraced embankments called Nautical Square, small islands of new apartment buildings on the north bank of the square, on the south bank a long building called the Leisure Centre. The centre contains shops, restaurants, cinemas and a climbing wall. On Charlemagne Street, the neighborhood's main axis, the Rhône-Alpes Regional Hotel is being built. Of the first phase's 101 acres, 54, more than half, are public spaces. It's a remarkable ratio for the heart of a city. Au fond, c'est le cœur de Lyon qui, qui attend qu'il puisse se développer et devenir vraiment un cœur, c'est-à-dire un centre urbain qui s'agrandit vers le sud, vers cet événement géographique, cet événement topographique qui est la confluence, qui est où deux fleuves, où un fleuve et une rivière euh, se rencontrent. Conceived by Swiss architects Herzog and de Meuron, the project's second phase covers 86 acres on the Rhone side. It will occupy what was once the wholesale market. The project is divided into two parts. The northern part will expand Saint Blondine and become the market area, creating a dense and diversified city. The southern part, that the designers call the Campo or the Field, will be a partially developed private park spanned by public footpaths. It will be linked on the east and west by new bridges or walkways. We want to certain portions of the market 
d'avoir une continuité architecturale, de garder une identité de quartier. La transformation de structures industrielles est dans beaucoup de cas presque meilleure pour l'industrie créative que des bâtiments euh, neufs. The streets in St. Blondine will be extended into the new shopping neighborhood. Buildings lining the road will be of varied heights and open onto inner garden courtyards that can be crossed on foot. Ce front de ville avance vers le sud. Et à un moment donné, vous avez effectivement une transversale qui va marquer symboliquement la fin de la ville, on va dire dans le prolongement de ce qu'il était. This decision by the designers orients the city towards the countryside and the distant horizon. Ce mélange du paysage et de ce développement urbain est très très important et très spécifique. C'était d'ailleurs une volonté d'il y a plus de dix ans de dire mais si on veut que les gens restent ici en centre-ville, si on veut éviter cette fuite des nouveaux habitants vers les quartiers périphériques, phénomène qui s'est peu ralenti depuis lors, alors sans doute il faut qu'on soit à la fois très urbain mais en même temps très immergé dans le paysage. As you can see, Lyon is a smart and sustainable city. Some of our Lyon most innovative companies help us to build up the vision of our city in the future. I would like to give the floor to one of them. The company is called For City, and the CEO, Mr. Thomas Lagier, is here to give us a quick presentation on, on their know-how. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Galliano, to, uh, to give me the opportunity to, uh, to present uh, what uh, we are doing uh, in Lyon. Um, so, uh, For City is a growing, is a, is a young startup, two years old, 52 person, and uh, we help decision makers to uh, make complex decisions. And uh, for that, we have a powerful uh, decision tool, a powerful platform with a collaborative 3D experience and uh, with the ability to do systemic modeling. So I will just give you two examples of what we are doing on your metropole very uh, concretely. So first example is a, is a public transport issue. Uh, Lyon had uh, just inaugurated a new uh, football stadium. The stadium is uh, big, but the stadium is far from a uh, main uh, transport line. And um, the experts and uh, the, media, the media were very pessimistic on the ability to deliver an efficient public transport service. So the transport operator um, asked us to simulate a lot of different scenarios. And um, with the data of the Metropole of Lyon, and also with the data of the operator, we're able to, to build a powerful decision tool. And um, as you can see, um, we, are able to, um, we are able to simulate and compare um, different scenarios and different criteria, different KPIs. We're able to calculate isochron. I, I, it doesn't work. Is it, uh, sorry, could you uh, launch uh, the movie? So this is small, uh, this is um, movies to illustrate uh, what the decision tool help uh, to, to do. So you can see calculation of uh, isochrone. So you can estimate the time, the time to leave the stadium and the time to reach uh, your final uh, destination. You can also assess the systemic impact on the world traffic. Uh, on the public transport quality, especially for people who are not uh, concerned by the football, but they just want to move in the rest of the, of the metropole. And also, we are able to take into account uh, traffic, as you can see here, and um, to um, measure the influence of the traffic of vehicles on the public transport, for example, on the uh, speed of the tram, of the buses and shuttles. So um, with this example, uh, the operator were able to compare um, quantities of different scenarios and uh, to choose the most efficient and the most resilient scenario. And the good news is that there were no trouble during the, 
the, inaugura the inauguration of the football stadium. Um, the second example um, is energy planning. As uh, explained by uh, Mr. Galliano, uh, Lyon is uh, proactive on uh, energy and on greenhouse gas uh, reduction. So the application developed um, allowed to assess the energy consumption uh, for each building with a statistical approach. And the idea is to uh, be able to represent, for example, uh, the consumption of different buildings, as you can see there, and also to know um, and also to know the source of energy per building. In this example, you can see uh, buildings uh, provided uh, in energy by the heating um, district network, uh, and uh, this is a very low carbon uh, network. So it's interesting to know wh which are the building concerned. Uh, so you can also. Um, and develop scenarios and compare scenarios. Uh, so a scenario is composed of different actions. So you can take an action. You can um, change parameters of the action. And you can combine um, the different action together. Um, the, the, the idea, for example, is to test the effect of um, of a program of uh, insulation of all building or to test the tendential uh, change in the behavior of the, of the, of the population. Um, and at the end, you can answer different questions. For example, um, do I have to build another energy facility or do I have to, uh, to stimulate the, the behavior change and the, the, um, the renovation program for building? Uh, you can also, for the, for the global metropole planning, uh, you can also um, know the action to engage to reach the goal and the KPIs of, uh, uh, concerning energy planning. Or you can also have um, a cost-effective approach to uh, ensure that uh, the actions that you engage are the best one uh, on a cost-effective way. And to conclude, um, we are convinced that uh, systemic uh, approach breaks the silos and um, create a lot of added value, as you can see on this different example. We are now um, addressing uh, other issues like multimodal, as you can see at the top, or multimodal hub or um, water planning. And the basic idea, in fact, is to, uh, is, is to mutualize in a backbone um, the, the data information project and uh, this backbone we call it uh, digital city mirror and at the at the top of this of this uh, digital city mirror you can imagine uh, address a lot of different issue and uh, build a powerful decision tool the goal at the end is always to help decision maker which are uh, private company which are local authorities to make the good decision and the goal at the end of that is to have the smartest uh, city. Thank you for your attention. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Wyke and I work for the Greater London Authority. Um, I've come to talk to you today just to sort of give you a city's perspective. Hopefully what I'm about to talk about will sort of pick up on a number of things that we've actually discussed during the, the course of the morning. So hopefully you'll sort of get a chance to see how the city sort of implementing some of the uh, things that we've sort of been, been talking about. Um, I'm going to talk basically about the role that we um, play in addressing climate change, mitigating climate change, delivering sustainable energy, and then also sort of the role that we've specifically got for sort of district district energy in that. Oh, have you? Have you got ah? Oh, thank you. Okay, just um, as I mentioned, I will talk quickly about the GLA family just so that you know the context for the Greater London Authority. Um, I'll just touch on political commitment and sort of 
senior leadership in organisations really fundamental for sort of helping to drive these kind of initiatives forward. I'm going to talk about our climate change mitigation energy strategy, and then the role of district energy, and then just sort of walk you through the journey that London's been on since sort of about 2000 when the um, GLA was sort of set up, sort of what we've done to enable district energy and where we're thinking we're hoping to go. Okay, basically sort of the Greater London Authority is a regional government and within the Greater London Authority there are actually sort of 33 local authorities. So we work at a regional government level setting strategic direction. Also sort of within the um, Greater London Authority we have um, London and Partners which is a sort of an inward investment organisation. We have Transport for London, we have the Metropolitan Police, Fire and Emergency Services and also the Olympic Legacy Development Corporation. Well, unfortunately, the slides don't seem to have quite come out on the formatting, but we'll crack on anyway. And then sort of as part of that, as I mentioned, it's um, a very strategic organisation. So we've got a number of strategies that the sort of mayor needs to develop. The major one is this spatial planning strategy. That's the London plan. We've talked a lot about sort of planning already sort of today. And it's sort of it is fundamental to the evolution, the development and the growth of the city. What can we do in London to enable sort of growth to happen in the most sustainable way? Well, if we have a transport strategy that sort of looks at transport infrastructure, how enabling people to move in and around the city. We have an economic development strategy that looks at economic development, obviously, then a number of environmental strategies of which the climate change mitigation energy strategy is one. We've talked a lot about the um, challenges of today, so I won't sort of go into those too much. But I think sort of in London, we've got a real big challenge around growing populations. We've um, just this year, sort of, um, just actually last year, sort of we hit 8.7 million people. That's the largest as London's ever been in its history, just topping the, um, in the 1930s when there was a big movement into London again. So we've now got sort of a larger population that we've ever had in our history. And the projections are that sort of by 2050, we could be sort of over 11 million people. So that's sort of over, so potentially getting up to about 100,000 people coming into London. Um, each and every year. So obviously so that presents massive infrastructure um, challenges, that's um, accommodation, workspace, obviously sort of that energy issue as well. Then on top of that we've obviously got to ensure that we've got security of supply, we've got um, affordable um, energy infrastructure addressing things like fuel poverty which is an issue in the UK and also sort of obviously sort of meeting those climate goals as well. And sort of what we sort of hope to do sort of through this is sort of by one, addressing energy efficiency, reducing demand, but also sort of looking at energy generation at a city level and sort of trying to more move towards a sort of a more um, circular energy economy, economy within the city where sort of we're, generate, we're reducing demand, we're generating some more energy within the city, but we're also utilising secondary energy sources within the city, integrating those into our energy systems, so we're um, removing demand for primary energy upstream. And then also sort of the other thing that's really important for us is to integrate um, heating and power systems. Sort of quite often those two infrastructures have worked quite separately, but increasingly we're looking at district energy, the role it can play not only in providing heat and low carbon heat and affordable heat, but also the role it can play in supporting the electricity network and bringing on larger amounts of sort of um, intermittent renewables into the electricity network, also the role it can play in grid balancing and enabling like sort of um, storage of surplus electricity as thermal, <laughs> as heat, and then utilising that within our heat networks. Um, oh dear, we've really got some <laughs> formatting issues now. Basically this is just to tell you about the, um, the our climate change targets. We've got two major targets. Our first one is a 60% carbon reduction target by 20. Uh, 25 with an 80% by 2050 but as a city we'll be hoping to go beyond that 80% that's a national um, requirement that 80% by 2050 and this is sort of and this what this gives you is an indication of where those emissions come from you can see almost 80% of our emissions uh, come from buildings that's so <clears throat> that's a real big challenge for us, existing um, buildings. And so that's consumption within those buildings and sort of the supply of energy into those buildings. And then transport is about 20 20%, just over 20%, 22 And so that's because we've got a very extensive public transport system. Quite unusual for a major city to have that lower level of emissions in transport. That's because we've got a very extensive public transport system that allows people to move around in the most 
efficient way. Obviously, we're putting additional infrastructure in place, additional investment into that to continue that, creating sort of very interconnected transport hubs that allow people to move around the city without having to actually um, get in private vehicles. And this is just a graphic to show you basically sort of where <laughs> Air London CO2 emissions. You can sort of see 1990 were about 45 million tonnes. In 1990, it peaked in 2000 at just over 50 million tonnes per annum. And then we sort of dropped um, over the course of the, sort of the next 13 years. You can sort of see 2013 was sort of just over 40 million tonnes. So that's about a 12% reduction in CO2 from 1990 levels. And you'll have remember from a previous slide, we've got a 60% by 2025. But actually, sort of by 2015, we're hoping to get to 20%. So, fingers crossed we'll get there. And this is just very quick um, to show you sort of how we sort of break that down. We look at our sort of what we're doing in three sectors. Basically, at a buildings level, we've got residential and commercial and public. We sort of break those down and the emissions related to those, and also from a transport perspective as well, and sort of what each of those can do and where um, reductions might come from. And so we've got existing activities that are happening, new uh, government initiatives that will work, we've got mayoral initiatives that will sort of ad add additional activity, and then we've also sort of got future activity from both government and at a mayoral level to try to reduce emissions further. So we want to go from 45 uh, million tonnes per annum down to 18 million tonnes per annum by 2025. And this is just a sort of summary of that climate change mitigation energy strategy. We look at it at a sector by sector basis. And sort of, um, what we're sort of really concentrating on in um, London sort of is using public money to sort of help catalyse the market, support the market, prove the business case, show that investment opportunities sort of make financial sense, de-risk that activity so that we're attracting public sector money in to support that. What we're wanting to do is look at programmes that are able to scale up so that we're actually able to scale those up and sort of and deliver those across London in the most sort of financially effective way. As I mentioned before, we've got 33 London boroughs within London, so we need to work very, very closely with those to ensure that a, the programmes that we're looking to do and that they're looking to do are as effective as possible. And then, obviously, we're looking to sort of set an example through the GLA group and what we can do both at a London, UK and a global level. OK, just a little bit about our energy efficiency and our transport programmes very quickly, and then I'll just move on to the, the district energy aspect. So we do obviously sort of recognise energy efficiency fundamental to sort of meeting our um, energy goals and also sort of to ensuring that we've got sort of affordability of energy supply. So we've got two major sort of programmes, one for uh, residential called uh, Renew and another for public buildings, which is sort of looking at supporting uh, retrofit of existing buildings to reduce demand. Also around transport, sort of mitigating um, emissions related to transport. I mentioned that we've got very extensive public transport system and consequently sort of a lot of investments going, going into that. And when we're looking at buses and things, we're looking at hybrid buses and hydrogen buses. We've got examples of those in London that are helping to sort of create market opportunities for those types of technologies and hoping to increase those continually throughout the decade. Then obviously sort of individual private um, vehicles and things as well. So sort of cars, scooters, we've already got some hydrogen taxis sort of in, in the sort of the that iconic sort of London black cab um, design as well. We've got sort of, and we mentioned congestion charge a little earlier as well. So sort of got congestion charge and sort of where if you've got sort of low emission vehicles then sort of you're exempt from that congestion charge. So again, um, trying to sort of work towards encouraging the market and obviously looking at sort of how we can integrate sort of infra supporting infrastructure. Okay, and then now sort of just talking about that sort of decentralised energy and district energy aspect. Um, I mentioned we've got a 25% decentralised energy target, which basically means that in London what we're looking to do is provide 25% of our energy demand um, from local energy sources by 2025. And we've estimated this will sort of reduce our carbon emissions by sort of around 3.2 million tonnes, hopefully more, depending on the sort of the type of technologies that are sort of integrated in that and sort of deliver sort of 12%, it's a minimum 12% of our CO2 savings. Um, over 50% of that we're sort of um, expecting to come from large and medium scale sort of district heating systems. Obviously combined heat and plough play a role in that but obviously as we go um, through the years increasingly there will be contributions from renewable and also sort of waste heat or sort of secondary energy sources. 
And just something here to sort of mention that sort of, and I mentioned about the investment opportunity and things. It's something that we're sort of really keen to do in London is to sort of promote actually what the challenge is, what we need to do to address it, but actually what that investment opportunity is for businesses. Again, it's going back to that job creation opportunity investment. And sort of, we're looking at sort of about a 10 um, fold increase in generating capacity, but it's sort of estimated through a study we did at about an 8 billion investment opportunity. And sort of at the moment, we're getting increasingly favorable policy framework at a national level. Obviously, we've already got very sort of um, favorable policy framework at a, uh, London, oops, at a London level as well. So sort of what that doing is that supporting activity in that area. And as I mentioned before, what we're looking to do is try to remove the barriers to delivering district energy, sort of sharing risk with the private sector and sort of sh um, harnessing private sectors, both their um, finance and also their ability to deliver. Um, okay, and sort of we've talked a lot about electricity here and sort of in the renewables things, but actually sort of in London, sort of heat, I mean like in sort of across the world, uh, heating and cooling, we've got sort of nearly half of our energy demand actually sort of comes from, from heat. And sort of consequently that's a really sort of large part of the sort of the challenge that we've got, about 30% of our CO2 reductions. And sort of we think that sort of in London we've got sort of that's a really good opportunity for us to sort of um, help to lead the way in London and sort of look at sort of what's the best way of decarbonising that area. So we work very closely with national government on electricity and policy and decarbonisation, but decarbonisation in the UK sort of is happening a lot at a national level, sort of decarbonising the grid. So we're working closely with national government. But we think um, London has got a real important role to play in heat. What we're looking to do there is obviously reduce the level of um, energy demand for heat sort of um, we're looking at sort of locally sourcing sort of a number number of that those issues reducing the carbon intensity of the heat what we're sort of starting to move to more and more is about sort of low carbon districts and things and neighborhoods actually sort of not just doing energy efficiency or decarbonization of supply but bringing those two together so that you're able to sort of deliver a low carbon and ultimately zero carbon district in the most cost effective way then also sort of we are, as i mentioned sort of london's a sort of a high density urban environment with high heat demand so there's a number of places within london where sort of we've done <coughs> our research and sort of actually sort of district heating um, is sort of the most cost-effective and carbon-effective way of sort of supplying those solutions. That's really important to us. What we do is we always look at what is the cost of um, delivering heat into um, homes and sort of how com cost-competitive is uh, district energy. Now I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the process that we've sort of gone through sort of between <coughs> since we were sort of set up to sort of t to where we've got to. Initially I mentioned the... Um, our spatial plan, the London plan, that sets the sort of the development framework sort of for London and how we see London evolving and growing. Um, what, we sort of, what that enabled us to do was to sort of have a look at what sort of what our energy demand is, sort of we gained our political support and sort of what we're trying to sort of do now is one, ensure that planning policy is encouraging district energy and also sort of where we've got opportunities for district energy were um, providing support to develop those projects out. So a lot of energy master planning. So what we did initially was a uh, London heat map, which was basically just sort of looking at London and sort of saying, where is the heat demand in London? Where are the heat sources? Do we have a viable business case for developing district heating in various parts of the city? And what you'll sort of see from the map on the right is there sort of significant parts of sort of where heat demand sort of we believe is sufficiently high to make sort of district energy a cost competitive way of supplying heat into buildings. This publicly available, so it sort of helps um, all stakeholders to be able to develop an understanding of where we see district energy might go. And then taking that another step further is our energy master planning, actually taking that heat map and going down into greater resolution, understanding where the real opportunities for district heating are, where they might be, what they might look like, what the uh, network routes might be, and what local authorities or lo uh, need to do to be able to sort of safeguard those areas and encourage the development of district heating in those areas. So supportive planning policy. And we've done that in um, 14 14 of the boroughs already and as part of our London plan we have things called opportunity areas which are large scale regeneration areas within London where we see large amounts of residential uh, development and job creation happening and sort of for those areas we create energy master plans which will sort of drive and um, supports the energy system development. And then what we needed to do was develop projects out so, so we know where 
our heat demand is, sort of we know what the air system is sort of starting to look like, but sort of how can we get those projects developed and brought to market. And we had an EU funded um, project through the European Investment Bank that provided us with development funding to provide technical, commercial and financial support to stakeholders to be able to develop out district heating systems and take them to market, get them funded. And we had three million pounds of which sort of 10% um, of that was funded by the GLA, 90% by the European Investment Bank. That sort of, and that £3 million has provided us over the four years from 2011 to 2015 with a pipeline of 21 projects that we've actually taken right through to market. That's over £100 million with the projects. And we've got a number of other projects obviously in the pipeline that we've developed through that and that we're looking at developing a successor um, program that will continue to support the development of those projects. Really, really important for developing district energy to have that technical and commercial support. And then the other bit I've talked to quite a lot about is investment and things. And well, one of the things we recognised we needed to do was to create an investment vehicle that would actually support the development of these projects and provide um, a rate of interest that would sort of allow them to sort of um, provide a commercial rate of return. And so this is something we set up using European Regional Development Fund. It's a uh, European funding stream matched with public sector money and then matched again with private sector money, creating an opportunity to fund district energy projects, prove the business case, prove that they're commercially viable, raise awareness and understanding within the financial sector of what the demands are for um, district energy projects and hopefully sort of encouraging greater flows of um, funding into uh, district energy. 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 Energy.